share uh, this uh, recording of the event after all with all of you. So you can uh, catch up uh, with perhaps some information you might have missed. Um, why this, uh, this webinar? Uh, discovering ICT careers. Uh, we need ICT experts in Europe. We need ICT experts because we need to support uh, the digital transformation of our economy. Uh, Digitalisation is now um, part of our everyday, everyday life and work, but we need the right people with the right skills to support this, uh, this, this important change and especially to grab all the opportunities that this digitalization, this digitalization wave is bringing to to Europe uh, and beyond, of course. Um, uh, we will try to uh, inspire uh, young people, students and youth to uptake a career in digital. So to have the right digital skills to then uh, perform, uh, perform their work. And uh, we will try to inspire, inspire you uh, with a lot of speakers with uh, different backgrounds. They will tell us their stories. They will tell us their initiatives, uh, what they are doing, you know, to support uh, this, uh, uh, this young generation, these young people to uh, uptake a career in digital. Uh, but before that, uh, we are going to uh, talk about a bit how educational policies are uh, supporting uh, this wave of, uh, of digitalization and uh, also how uh, schools can better prepare um, the generation, the, the next working generation. So with no further ado, actually, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker of, uh, of this event. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, European Commission's uh, Rehana Schwininger Ladak. She is head of unit of uh, uh, DigiConnect G2 Interactive Technologies, Digital for Culture and Education, and uh, it's the unit which is actually uh, monitoring and following the implementation of the digital skills and job platform. So Rehana, thanks a lot. Please, the floor is yours. Let us know what the European Commission is doing to support uh, the uptake of digital skills. Thank you, Alessandra. So uh, many thanks uh, uh, for, for giving me the possibility to speak uh, to, to everyone today. I'm very pleased uh, to be here and I'm speaking from, you know, grey Luxembourg. Uh, but uh, Christmas is not too far away, so that's that motivates and inspires us uh, as in uh, using the, the word of uh, Alessandra. So um, I'm, I'm Rehana and uh, I'm the head uh, of the unit which is in charge of a number of policies and especially the policies in relation to digital skills and education uh, at the Commission. And um, uh, as some of you heard during the last meeting with the national coalitions uh, from the 1st of November, we have taken over. Uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the uh, our colleagues, uh, yeah, you've been uh, dealing with uh, Jakub Katman. So I'm here today with my colleagues uh, uh, Kinga Katona, uh, Vitis Fortilgard, and Ioannis uh, Gaviotis. Uh, so they will be uh, your your uh, your counterparts at the at the Commission. And really, we're very very pleased to be part of this important exercise. So, uh, Alessandra, you said this. You know the the context, uh, and I think it's a very important. Uh, to say this up front is why you know why are we doing this so as you said the the it it is it is a wave of digitalization but it is beyond that what we see is that we rely on digital technologies for uh, everything i mean during confinement what we saw is that the borders closed but not the digital borders so we continued to keep to to work to keep in touch to interact to collaborate through technologies digital uh, technologies and and a uh, network and this shows really the fundamental need that we will have uh, for these kind of of, uh, of, of, uh, of digital use and what is important is that we need this is part also of what we call our digital sovereignty is to make sure that on the one hand we have enough people who are able to use these technologies and on the other hand we have enough people who can um, uh, develop these technologies here in Europe. It is very important for us that we should be able to master and develop our own capabilities. So this is really the, 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 the context in which all this is happening. Now, this is an important here slide that you're looking at, which is about the overall policy that guides us. So because we see uh, a growing need for companies 
uh, to recruit, uh, to find workers with who have the right digital skills. And actually, the numbers are terrible. Huh? We see that more than half of EU enterprises that are recruiting or that have tried to recruit uh, ICT specialists have serious difficulties in filling their vacancies. It's it's um, this shortage we see in many um, different sectors, but when it comes to ICT specialists, it's even more acute. And in 21, uh, 54 percent of the European population had basic digital skills and there were about 9 million ICT specialists in, in the EU. So what we see is clearly those numbers are not important if we want to make sure that we will have the right capabilities. The overall target that we are aiming at, which will give us the safety net or the right um, how do you say, capacities uh, to be able to develop and use our technologies is the numbers that you see on the slide, which is that we need to have 80% of the population able to master digi basic digital skills and to be able to develop all the technologies ourselves, we need by 2030 to have 20 million ICT specialists. And when we look at the progress we are making every year, it's going to be a hard way. It's going to be really, really a road which is going to be challenging. Uh, challenging. So what we clearly need is really how can we step up all the efforts at regional level, at national level and at European level. So together we can arrive at these numbers uh, because it's it's really it's, it's an important uh, um, uh, uh, shortage. And in addition uh, to the uh, shortage, which is structural of skilled staff, we also see that there's a persistent, persistent gender gap because only one in five ICT specialists and ICT graduates are women, uh, which, which also affects uh, the way digital solutions are devised and, and deployed. So this is an important uh, really dimension for us getting enough ICT specialists with a convergence between men and women and basic uh, basic uh, 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 amazing, uh, uh, population mastering the basic skills. And if we move to the next slide now to support uh, the work that is going on, uh, we have set up uh, the digital skills and job platform, which is manned as a one stop shop for digital skills in Europe that brings together all the initiative, the resources and the digital skills community. On it, you will find apologies. I forgot to put my uh, lap, my my mobile phone on on mute, and there's a birthday, so there are many wishes going on. So, the, in this uh, um, one-stop shop, you will find um, good practices, training opportunities, studies, national strategies, data, opinion posts. So it's really it's it's a dedicated community uh, community space where there is an exchange of experience where you can find partners where you can have organizations that that uh, uh, that present what they are doing and we have also added a new feature for pledges uh, where companies organizations can make make concrete contributions uh, for reducing uh, the digital skills gap so we can move to the next slide now the obviously um, the platform is one thing. On the other hand, we need to accompany uh, the the efforts that are going on uh, at the um, uh, on the field, and for that we have uh, the program, our uh, Digital Euro program, which is really a program dedicated to reinforcing our capabilities. And with this, we aim to stimulate an ecosystem approach, an ecosystem based thinking and networking between higher education institutions to make us really to, to give us the lead uh, in training enough data engineers, uh, quantum specialists, AI specialists, cybersecurity experts. As you see, it's we are really uh, in a critical moment with all the different cyber attacks happening uh, on a massive scale. So the program supports the development of highly specialized courses in digital various digital technologies. So we have a twofold uh, goal, which is to contribute to the training of future digital experts and to develop new learning opportunities that are delivered in partnership with universities, res research and businesses. The, the aim is also to, um, uh, to, to diminish the gap between academia and the needs of, of, uh, of industry. So with the first two calls for proposals that we had, we already supported almost 250 organizations in the EU 
among which many university, research centers and businesses. And together they will design new education programs and courses uh, for, for you. So there is uh, what is important right now, there is a call which is open for the design and delivery of innovative bachelor's and master's program in digital areas, and also bringing the multidisciplinary dimension, which is so much needed, because it's not that we need just uh, specialists in one specific sector, but these need to really bring in the different uh, multidisciplines that are needed. So there you have some basic uh, information about the call, and we will be happy, of course, to uh, circulate the slides, Alessandra, so people can have access to all this information. So if we can go to the next slide. And uh, so uh, community led uh, uh, activities, which is the, the platform, uh, the funding. And then, of course, we have uh, Code Week, which is a grassroots initiative because we need uh, to intervene from from different, uh, you know, from different angles. And Code Week is really an important grassroots initiative that aims uh, to spread uh, computational thinking, coding, and related digital skills to as many people as possible. And this is to really help improve the digital skills across the across member states, to widen the offer, lower the barriers for teachers, to integrate programming and, and technology in their everyday teaching practices, and also provide equal access uh, to digital scale uh, to, to all children, regardless of their economic background. And we're quite happy with the numbers, but we really want to expand them further. Uh, in the last five years, uh, we had more than 15 million people uh, who participate uh, in the Code Week, uh, with the average year of 11 years. And the, um, the initiative has trained more than 20,000 teachers. So it's, it's, those are good numbers, but we need to go beyond that and really uh, uh, have even more uh, educators and 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 and, uh, and students joining the uh, this this effort, and if we can go to the next slide, Alessandra, and the last thing here, uh, I think I have two more slides, a, a few more. I, I I know I'm 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 speaking more than five minutes, but I just wanted to give you uh, a quick uh, overview of all the different initiatives that we are doing. So the structured dialogue is an important part because it is a dialogue that we are we have launched with member states on digital education and skills. So the um, um, goal is to have dialogues uh, between governments to map all ongoing efforts uh, in member states, identify gaps and join forces at EU level, and based on this dialogue to see what kind of actions we can develop to have more people uh, joining a specialized course as well as basic, uh, basic skills. Uh, we are approaching the end of this um, uh, this uh, exercise, and uh, the next year uh, it will culminate the uh, all the the, the different uh, bilaterals we had with member states. They will culminate uh, in two important policy uh, documents, which are called recommendations. One will be on enabling factors for digital education, and the other one will be on improving digital skills. And they will contain a number of actions for member states and then a number of actions for uh, for the Commission. Uh, there is also uh, the Pact for Skills and, and Digital Large Scale Partnerships, which is a very important endeavour as well. Uh, it's a recent initiative which aims to get public and private organisations together and encouragement to make concrete commitments to upskilling and reskilling adults. And this is also going to focus on the shortage of ICT specialists and gender imbalances. So we are really tackling it with different initiatives, but they work hand in hand. And the, the final um, uh, initiative that I would like uh, to highlight, it's the European Years of Skill. You know, every year there's one which is dedicated to a subject. Um, so this one is the European Year of Youth, where we had a lot of activities for activities focusing on youth. Next year will be on skills. The idea is to, is to put a spotlight uh, on this need that we have and to roll out a number of actions. So we, so we will have many actions uh, that aim at getting more people on board. And um, I, I really would encourage you to really take part in all the initiatives uh, so that you can also become ambassadors and support uh, the take up, implementation of and delivery of the different actions. And there will be a lot of events and awareness raising campaign uh, organized across the EU. 
uh, with, with different partners about how we can uh, go forward in up, upskilling and reskilling. So in conclusion, uh, what I want to say is that this is a very important area uh, because it's really about uh, young people's future. It's about uh, improving all the capabilities for you to thrive on the labor markets, for you to be able to really master your future. Because in 10 years, we are going to be speaking about a world which is going to be even more uh, relying on technologies. So these actions are paving the way for you to have a world in which you have all the skills and capabilities that then you can drive forward. And this is really the spirit of all these initiatives that are being put in place uh, about really building uh, a more sustainable, obviously, and, and, and a more, um, uh, um, how do you say, um, uh, secure and, uh, and, and wealthy uh, future for, for young people. Voilà. So that's, that's, Alessandra, that's what I wanted to say in a few words, and I apologize if I have spoken to for too long. Thank you, Rihanna. Actually, uh, it's uh, it's all good. And thank you actually for taking the time also to present all the initiatives. Actually, there's a lot of going on, so it's good that the audience is aware of, uh, you know, everything that uh, that is in the pipeline and uh, what we can expect, you know, from next year as we are, you know, anyway, in the last month of 2022. Um, also, thank you actually for mentioning the importance of gender convergence. Uh, we will have a dedicated uh, session on that during the panel so we will talk about also how we can encourage women actually to uh to study uh scientific subjects and then pursue a career uh which is related to that um you have presented the objectives it's ambitious uh, ambitious objectives so how can we you know reach uh, in concrete terms uh, these objectives i would like to uh first call on the on the stage dr anthony mann from the oecd he will give a presentation on how schools can actually help uh youth and the young students to uh pursue uh the career you know which is best fit for them uh, but before that, I kindly invite you to join our Mentimeter. Uh, you can do it by um, checking the QR code uh, with your phone directly, or you can go to uh, menti.com and insert the number that you see on the slide, or I'm sure that my colleagues are sharing the link in the chat as well. Um, we will show the results uh, at the end of the at the end of the event. We are asking you uh, what is your background, so uh, what have you studied or what are you studying, and also uh, how many years of professional experience you have if you are already a young professional or a professional. So we will see the results later on and now i would kindly ask dr man to uh, share his uh, presentation and uh, please the floor is yours well thank you so much and uh, good morning to everybody um so i work at oecd and i'm going to share with you some of the data which we have about the kind of the nature of the the challenge um and possible um kind of solutions um, and thinking about this urgent need to um, develop um, a greater workforce in terms of um, ICT um, capabilities. I'm going to jump straight in because I don't have long to speak to you. And um, I'm going to be using PISA for um, initially. PISA is the, the OECD's program for international student assessment. And um, within PISA, we, which we do every sort of three years, um, we um, we ask hundreds of thousands of young people from around the world, um, certainly across um, nearly the whole of Europe, um, 79 countries in total. Um, we ask them lots of questions about all sorts of different things, including um, what type of job they expect to get or expect to have by the age of 30. And that's kind of very interesting for us because we kind of know from longitudinal data that um, that uh, an occupational expectation as a teenager serves a predictive quality. You're kind of more likely to end up in that sort of profession than somebody with similar sets of qualifications or skills, but just doesn't 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 have that in mind, you know, kind of for yourself. And so um, I'm going to show you some slides here, which give you the sense of what you know the extent to which young people are interested in um, jobs in information communications technologies. And I'm looking particularly at you know, Group 25 in 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 ISCO, the International Standard Classification of Occupation. And I'm going to jump straight in by showing you, um, firstly, the boys. So this is 2018 PISA, 
And this is the percentage of, of boys in the survey who expressed an opinion about the type of job they expect to have by age 30. I've seen a lot of variation there, huge amounts of variation between countries. But now I'm going to show you the girls and you have to look quite carefully because. Sorry, I have to get my slide working. There we go, because the girls are here at the bottom. You see in these little um, red bars. And okay, it's well known that, you know, we heard earlier that only 20% of the professionals we're, we're interested in are, are female. Um, but at age 15, we find uh, far, far fewer girls expressing interest in ICT, perhaps no surprise. But you can see here that in some countries, in, in Israel, in Bulgaria, Serbia, Romania, more girls are interested than uh, is the case for boys in, in Norway. You know, so we shouldn't be um, deterministic about this. It's, you know, gender doesn't determine, you know, kind of people's interest by any means. Um, and one of the questions we can ask ourselves is, you know, is the gender gap narrowing um, or is it sort of like, you know, getting worse? And so here we've got data from 2006 when we did PISA then, and we asked students what sort of job they expected to have in a, um, at age 30. And you can see quite a lot of variation. Um, this is the gap in terms of percentage points. Um, so, you know, very large in some areas, much smaller in others. And then if we look what's happened in 2018, so this is the, the line here, um, in kind of like a light blue. And we'll see that in some countries, but, you know, the gap is narrowing. In other countries, the gap's getting worse. We don't really have um, in a kind of really strong pattern. And we can look as well at, you know, kind of data from tertiary programs, from university programs. See, are, are women enrolling in, you know, bigger numbers? There's a bigger proportion of students sort of going into tertiary educations and ICT. And we kind of find, you know, if you look here in a, uh, a number of countries, Portugal, example, Hungary, we find as a percentage of students studying um, these programs, you know, women are women are falling. You know, in other countries, we see a bit more, uh, a bit more increase. And if we look at how uh, ICT compares to other disciplines, well, it's very gendered. You know, we see a lot of lot of gendering up here. You know, lots of um, female students doing education and health and, and welfare. But this is a comparison between. Uh, 2019 and 2005 and maybe you know whole numbers are growing for both for both genders but you know these programs are still appearing to be less attractive only 20 percent of in students enrolling um, on ICT programs in the countries which we we're looking at be before you know are female now one of the issues here is that we kind of know that labor markets don't signal well to young people and this is a problem across the board um, this is the percent, this is the concentration of young people's career interests. So they're answering that question. What sort of occupation job do you expect to have at age 30? And then what we do is we group, you know, the most popular 10 jobs for the gender. And we're going to see here, you know, uh, uh, over on the right hand side, you know, more than 60, 70, sometimes 80 percent of young people say so it's going to be working one of 10 jobs and often they want to be professionals um, we see a very narrow sense of um, what they might do it's like in the labor market later on and um, we turn governments and societies turn to create guidance you know kind of to help young young people get a better sense of what the labor market has to offer to kind of to broaden and inform their um, their career thinking our problem has been historically that the data has been really poor you know, in order to be able to tell what works in terms of career guidance, you need to follow people through time. You need to see what happens to them, you know, when they're at school and then what happens to them five, ten years later once you're in the labour market. And there's not been a lot of analysis. We have known some things um, from studies. We've known that uh, programmes of work related learning, career pathways, you know, survey very well. Part time working, always associated with better outcomes or nearly always. So aspects around career thinking, there's some literature there, which is kind of very interesting. But in your basic career guidance interventions, do they really work? And so what we did um, last year was first time anybody's done this. We took a bit of a, a bit of a gamble. We identified as many national longitudinal data sets we could do. Um, we found it which asked questions about career related experiences as teenagers, typically at age 15. And then we look to see if they're related to better employment outcomes at age 25, putting controls in place to make sure that they weren't being distorted by the factors, integrating results into the new literature. Now, with longitudinal data, there's all sorts of kind of limit limitations, but this is the best possible data anybody has in the world to see what works in terms of career guidance. And this is what we found. 
If you look um, across the range of countries, and if you look for areas where you've got a, a, a critical mass of countries where you find positive results and you find an average of positive results across a range of countries, we do find that the way young people have first-hand experiences in the labour market makes a difference. The way they think about their futures makes a difference. Um, and this is lots and lots of new data about specific things which students can do. Um, or schools can do to help students progress towards better employment outcomes 10 years later. And the thing you'll notice about these is that a lot of them relate to, a lot of them relate to um, engagement with people in work. And that's essential to effective career guidance generally, but also important to um, um, enabling better signaling from the ICT industry to young people about the opportunities that are available and how they might progress towards them. And we make sense of this in a conceptualization by thinking about capitals. And it's useful for trying to imagine uh, you know, how we can help young people progress towards futures which are which are right for them. And I think our assumption here is that there are lots of young people who um, would be very well suited to careers in ICT, but there are barriers in the way. And effective guidance, particularly guidance which really engages the economic community in its delivery, we can see young people being better placed to build their human capital, deciding on the right qualifications, gaining useful experience, developing social capital in terms of new and trusted information, useful people that can help in their progression. We can think about uh, the ability, which we call cultural capital, to be able to visualise and plan the future, show agency, have confidence. And particularly if you think about those, you know, those, you know, the, the, the young women, you know, it's not a typical thing to do. And so what we need to do is to, you know, to make careers in, careers in computing and ICT thinkable to girls. We need to give them confidence that, you know, there are, there are careers for them, that, you know, these workplaces aren't hostile, that it's possible to, um, to, be, a, to be a woman and have a successful career in these fields. Um, and, that's, and, and we can do that through a number of ways. We can do them by exposing them to some of the skills they need to do, to give them um, an understanding of the industry. But the most important thing which we need to do is to help them um, investigate and reflect and think um, and experience possibilities of their futures in work by giving them authentic engagements with the working world. And that should start at primary school. And um, um, there's a program um, which lives in the UK called Primary Futures, where young people, uh, children are, are introduced to people in the working world, help them understand the relationship to what they're doing in school and who they, where they might work later on. Uh, a real focus on getting people who are underrepresented in the professions, men who work in healthcare, um, women who work in ICT, you know, to, to, show, to show young people at an early age that this is thinkable. And then as you go older, you know, we look at opportunities to hear firsthand from professionals working in the field. They have to ask them questions about what it's really like, um, what sort of things are useful to invest your time in while you're still in education. So you have to optimise your opportunities. Um, and that's that's with people coming into schools. And then we really we're, we're really very enthusiastic about the Girls Day programmes we see in Germany, where students can go into a workplace, job shadow for a day, where their where their gender is underrepresented. Let them see for themselves give them confidence, help them to understand whether it's right and thinkable for themselves. And we need to think about this in, a, in very pragmatic terms. And so I'm going to sort of finish up there because I know we haven't got long this morning, but um, do if you're interested in the work which we're doing. We're, we've got lots of work planned um, in this area and other areas, you know, kind of see us all on our website and you can contact me directly there. So at this point, I'm going to pause and tell you that these slides will be made available and wish you well for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Dr. Mang, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, indeed, I think you've given some good insights, especially also when it comes to, you know, educational policies and how perhaps they can support also uh, this improvement of uh, career guidance as we see uh, that it's actually quite uh, uh, quite important and timely when it comes to, you know, um, drive uh, the young generation and young people to, to the best, to the best uh, type of employment they can get for themselves. And uh, I would like to actually now introduce the, the second part of, of the event. Uh, we will have a panel discussion with representatives of uh, four different uh, national coalitions for uh, skills and job. So I hope you can see my slide with the, with the names yes, of the panelists. Um, I would like to remind the audience in the meantime that uh, you can use the chat actually to post uh, to post your questions and uh, we will try to, uh, 
to address them during the discussion. Uh, but now I kindly ask the panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, I'm quite happy to welcome uh, Gita Ramdian Singh. Uh, she's founder and CEO of Clearwater Skyfields. She will tell uh, she will tell more about it later. And I know it also relates to to the presentation that we just had. So please, uh, uh, you will have the time later to actually tell us how you are concretely um, doing that. Then we will hear from Lyubcho Mihailovsky. Uh, he is Global Business Development Manager at uh, Makers Red Box, a an Hungarian company working with, uh, with young people, but uh, as well he will tell us more about it uh, later. And then we will hear a very inspiring story from uh, Gulin Kizir Limak, um, R&D analyst at TreeShape. It's a Danish company. She will tell, her, her, she will tell us her story and how she uh, got there. Uh, precisely. And last but not least, uh, uh, I'm welcoming Elena Dia Alejo from uh, uh, Samsung. She is manager corporate citizenship and public affair, and uh, she will talk about uh, a, a program that is currently running in Spain to actually uh, train women in uh, in coding and scientific uh, career. We will also hear from a testimonial of uh, of the program, and she will share her her direct experience with us. So, Gita, you are the first one to, to come on board. So if you could tell us perhaps uh, what you do at Clearwater, uh, what you what your company does, but also how you know what's your story? So how did you get there? Uh, which kind of training did you get actually to then being able to work with uh, with the softwares you use in your company? Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, my name is Gita Ramdiansing. I'm the founder and CEO of Clearwater. Uh, we use biometric tools to assess uh, people characteristics uh, and uh, human interactions to uh, to predict uh, uh, social interactions, uh, which is uh, among others applied in uh, in the context of coaching, training, uh, personal development, uh, onboarding, and everything related to career progression. So I have a background in uh, behavior uh, sciences. Um, everybody's always talking about a background. Around, but I also like to say that I have a future in uh, in tools to support human interaction in general. So uh, it's um, uh, we're not done yet. Um, actually, I started as a consultant, as a coach trainer in a transforming organization uh, about 20 years ago. And um, during these processes, I, I assessed people uh, based on questionnaires because that was the only thing available uh, at the time to get an impression about what they needed to adapt to change. So uh, to get a bit a bit of an understanding, it's uh, it's about a 45 minute uh, uh, process of, uh, of assessing. You need to answer about 120 questions. You need you get a high, one hour feedback sessions, and these costs are for um, uh, these assessments between, depending on what the company wants, between 300 and 3,000 euros, which is quite a lot of money. So during one session in where I had uh, a very big, big team uh, I was working with, this session was related to the, to the change within the organization and it triggered a lot of responses, you know, from neutral to emotional. And I actually was there, standing there on the spot, and I thought, oh, we don't need an assessment to understand what the situation actually is. So uh, I got actually inspired by the whole situation uh, uh, to rethink how can we retrieve data about characteristics, human interaction uh, in, 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 in a way that resonates with how we interact, interact in general. So I started to study facial uh, facial action coding, which um, is basically how to uh, uh, learn how to annotate the facial muscle movements uh, manually, which was uh, uh, based on observation. And at that time, it was still a researcher's only tool till the moment that software became available. Now. Having that said, software became available, but was still not as accurate as uh, human observation. So um, this entire process of recording a person, 
in, in a conversation, annotating the video material and providing and delivering a, a report in there. It was still quite, you know, a labor intensive process uh, till actually each of these uh, sections uh, became digitalized. The, the we have a video recording platform. There are many providers nowadays. The annotating software is becoming even more advanced, and the reporting is basically a product that we can uh, can uh, access on an online platform. So this is actually the the the, the stage from from a manual uh, context that moved into a, 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 a digital uh, digital context and a digital platform, which still means today that I'm not a programmer. I understand the foundation of photo, facial annotation, and I speak with programmers to 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 capture the the human facial muscle movement as 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 correct as it can be. Uh, we have had several stages now. Uh, of course, uh, with the video platform, it's always a big challenge of uh, camera quality, light conditions and everything. And of course, I can go on and on. But Alessandra, I think I'm within the five minutes. Yeah, actually, uh, timely, timely presentation. It's five minutes now. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, I will I will ask you more perhaps uh, on the results also you got from uh, you know from your software so also if you have some kind of recommendation you know for for young professionals uh, when it comes to you know deciding their career and uh, I would also like you to stress again that you are not a programmer because I think this is the this is the point here so you can work with a software with a very complex software without having to be uh, a programmer so thank you for sharing your story. Um, I would like now to uh, pass the floor to Ljubcu. Uh, Ljubcu, good morning and welcome. Um, I know you have prepared some slides uh, to describe what your company do uh, in Hungary. I will share them for you, so please let me know when, uh, when it's time to change them. And uh, I leave you the floor to let us know what you do to inspire and train a uh, young student to, to pursue a career in digital. Thank you. Grazie tante Alessandra. Uh, good morning and thanks for organizing this event. Uh, my name is Ljubcio Mihailovski. I'm a global business development manager for Rate Makers Redbox. Uh, we are a STEAM course developer for schools all around the world. And in the next slide, please, Alessandra. <clears throat> yes, uh, we work with teachers with youth uh, aged 11 to 17 to acquire the digital skills needed for the job market of tomorrow. That's uh, a brief sentence about us. So we take a step back uh, compared to university students and believe that the digital skills and the love for I I ICT, both for girls and boys, should be found in the early teen years. And it's up to us to support them, of course. Uh, next slide, please, Alessandra. Um, most of interactions even today, be it social work related, is through digital platforms, of course, data collection, analysis, uh, which is leading to informed decision making is uh, now a must in all sectors, not just ICT related jobs. But technology also uh, gives advantage to new players on the market. Let's say companies, smaller SMEs and smaller businesses can compete with the with the corporates. Uh, so I think it's about how we adapt as people um, and uh, job holders, let's say, but also as companies. Uh, Makers Redbox is uh, relaying this knowledge of technology and digital literacy to youth in a storytelling uh, and all-inclusive way, understandable for everyone, girls and boys. Um, it's, a, it's a very good uh, step in the right direction that both SMEs and uh, corporations are being aware and becoming aware of the urgent need of digital literacy of our youth. Uh, for example, Huawei Hungary approached us a couple of months ago asking us to create a story-based team curriculum uh, for girls from primary schools and high schools in order to raise their digital skills. What does this indicate? Uh, to me, th this means that uh, companies uh, know that uh, approaching university students, you know, many times they poach students from universities, it's a bit too late. Uh, so they are aware that raising the digital literacy of all kids, uh, regardless of the gender, uh, will enable them to also filter out those kids who want to pursue an ICT career. 
uh, but not all of them would uh, out of 30 kids in a class or 20, not all of them will go for an ICT career, right? But even the other ones will be enabled to acquire the basic digital skills, whether they become part of pharmacy or agricultural sector. Now it's uh, these digital skills and are needed everywhere. Next slide, please. Uh, Makers Redbox is a company based um, by STEAM education experts who develop story-based curricula. Um, our pedagogical uh, tools engage all children in a class. Uh, as I said, those going for an ICT career <clears throat> that hopefully can contribute to the target, was it 20 million ICT specialists uh, in Europe by 2030, but also the remaining uh, girls or boys who acquired the digital skills uh, needed for the jobs of tomorrow. Uh, next slide, please. We are present in 400 uh, schools in 15 countries, and we are working together with both public schools, uh, private schools, maker spaces, and other educational courses. But for example, we also work with juvenile correction facilities, and we try to help kids there um, who have gone down a bit of a wrong way to, to also find their digital skills and uh, have a better path in life. Um, there is a kind of a misperception that ICT is only for geeks or only for boys and uh, with our um, pedagogical tools which contribute to debunking those myths and enable all kids to start seeing the benefit of, of ICT. How do we do that? Um, if I could ask you for um, the... Perhaps, Ljubcho, you can, uh, you can save uh, how you do it for the next round of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, as there are uh, sure. five minutes have passed already, and actually I wanted to ask you to, uh, to talk about, you know, this uh, story-based curricula, sure, because you. I'm very curious, so I think I will make you the question uh, later on. Thank, thank you, you very much. So now, actually, I would like to pass the floor to Gulin uh, Kizilirmak. Uh, today, the names yeah. have been quite challenging for me, I must say, so I hope that I'm pronouncing them quite well. Um, but Gulin, you have a, a very inspiring story, so I will just let you, you know, talk about yourself and how, you know, training in, uh, in digital skills have helped you with your, with your career and with, uh, and with your life as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. So, uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I'm not used to talk in front of live audience, so I'm a bit excited and nervous at the same time. Today, I have selected two topics for you uh, that I believe you can relate to them, myself and Vedu School. So, I hear you asking who is Gulin and what is Ready School. Let me share my story first uh, and I will get to back to Ready School shortly. So, I'm Gulin uh, from Turkey, almost 34 years old and married for two years. I have been living in Copenhagen in Denmark for almost two years due to my husband's job. Uh, he got an offer from a company called Visma Economic, an amazing company, by the way, in Denmark, and we moved from Turkey. Uh, I hold a master's degree in business administration, and I have had a strong desire to work in tech from the beginning. Uh, I have a role model who is my cousin. Uh, she has been working in IT since she graduated and it was very inspiring to see her going to work every day to do the rewarding job uh, and getting a high salary. Uh, she has been in tech industry nearly 24, 25 years now and promoted multiple times and she is still so satisfied with the job she is doing. Then I thought I could do the same. I studied business administration, attention police, not coding or programming, and started working in the tech industry as a business analyst when I graduated. Uh, I worked in the same company in Turkey for eight years until I moved to Denmark. So with our relocation to Denmark, uh, things started to get complicated and a little scary for me. We had moved to Denmark uh, to follow our dreams and to live a happier life, but living in Europe for the first time was daunting. Summary of my first year in Denmark was corona restrictions, job applications, rejections, freezing, dark winter days, starting life from scratch, but alone. 
with only my husband by me. Thanks to him, by the way. Now you ask me, did anything go right in your professional life? Yes, you are right. So things changed after um, meeting an organization called Ready. Ready School is a non-profit organization uh, that has different tech courses, coaching and mentoring sessions, workshops, events and tech fairs. It's all for us, for women of non-European descent to enrich our knowledge and to introduce us to the labor market. I did UX and UI uh, for six months, uh, yeah, six months there, and then um, I applied to a job in Danske Bank through Red School. So Danske Bank is a huge corporate here in Scandinavian region, actually, and I got the job, which was a great progress in my life. But what is more exciting? Then, than that, after my contract ended, because I started there with a contract, I got a full-time job offer from Danske Bank. However, I received another offer from another company named Tree Shape, and again through Red School, which I thought might be a better choice for me in terms of works and responsibilities. I accepted the offer, and I'm now working with a contract there. And my contract actually ends at the end of December, but my journey will not end. I will keep looking for new opportunities. What I want to say is there is a huge demand in the job market in tech. Don't be afraid pursuing your career or switching your professional life to IT. You have a good chance to finding yourself a place with excellent conditions in terms of salary and work-life balance and so on in European countries. So if you ask what my next step is, I will keep moving, applying for jobs and finding the best for myself. It can be scary and intimidating sometimes when you move another country without any international education or work experience. Things may not go as smoothly or, or as you would like, at least initially. However, this is my last part, by the way. Yes, no However, worries. There are people who cares about you, who hear and who see you. So it's your responsibility to find these great leaders and professionals and seek help. Never be afraid to reach out to people. Both in Danske Bank and in Tree Shape, I met great people who still support me professionally. I met Ready School and they are the reason why I'm stronger in the job market now. I met Hans and Dance Guy T because of this webinar. So surround yourself with good people, believe in yourself, have a can do attitude, fail or succeed. The most important thing is to learn and to grow. Don't try to be perfect, just be yourself. The Danish labor market is a diverse and an inclusive one. And I mean it when I say I'm one of you. So that's all from me. Thank you for thank you for this chance. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Gulin. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Uh, indeed, it's uh, it's a very inspiring story from a lot of point of view, from integration, from you know success. So really, thank you for sharing your story. And perhaps later on, I will ask you, you know, how the the skills that you that you acquired in Ready School are uh, are helping you in the job you're having right now. So let's move to the last speaker of the panel, uh, Elena. Hi, good morning. Hi, so uh, your presentation, I'm sure, somehow relates to Gulin's story because you are uh, running a program in Spain now which is targeting women. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from you, what you're doing and how you are uh, operating um, with your program. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for inviting Samsung to this webinar. It is a pleasure. I, I'm going to, to talk about uh, Samsung Desarrolladoras, that is, is the name in Spain, that is Samsung Deve Develop Women. And this is a program that we, are, we launched in the year 2017. Um, bueno, this program mm, is launched because 
the lack of professional and women in the ICT sector. No? As uh, Rihanna said before, previously, uh, only 30% out of the um, 9 million of people working in the ICT are women in this sector. So we develop a program to encourage uh, women, girls and women to, to study ICT. No? Our purpose is to palliate the the gap, the gender gap that that we we can see with the previous presentation with, uh, of Anthony. Uh, bueno, to secure a, a job in a competitive and technology driven workplace. Uh, this program is for women uh, the age between 18 to 35, more or less. Uh, that are interested in starting a career in, in STEAM. These girls or uh, these women, uh, women didn't need any coding and programmer knowledge. So we, we can uh, send this program for, for all the girls and women to, to encourage them. Uh, the program consists in uh, 350 hours distributed into seven months, more or less. And they can learn about the statics, the coding, programming, artificial intelligence, or machine learning. So far, we have training more than uh, 4,000 4, women since the years 2017. And, and we are very proud because we, we have uh, some recognized, uh, one of them for the European Commission, in the year 2020, Samsung Desarrolladoras was awarded by the European Commission in the Framework of the Digital Skills Awards, celebrated in Spain by AMETIC, that is the trade association in, in Spain. And this award is uh, recognized uh, and rewards projects that promote skills and digital transformation in women and, women and girls. Um, we have uh, some data about employability, about this these students and the half of the students have a job before enrolling the course. Uh, from those, close to 50% were working in ICT sector. Um, four of uh, out uh, 10 are working in ICT relative areas. It's seen that the course has increased the, the employment rate. Um, nothing, nothing else. After we can we can see the the testimonial the quote exactly. what we're aware of as a student. We will we will hear uh, from a student directly the her experience. This, uh, thank this you very much. To understand the program. <laughs> exactly, but thank you very much, Elena, for giving this overview okay. of this program. Um, there will be a digital skills award the next year as well. So just you know to 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 let you uh, to let you wish for it. Uh, you will hear more, of course, next year from from the digital skills and job platform. But uh, okay, let's go back to Gita. Gita, I see there is a question actually in the chat uh, that would be addressing uh, uh, your your job. Uh, they're asking in terms of statistics, uh, would your job be counted as ICT job? And uh, when we count the gap between ICT graduates and ICT companies needs, would your job be counted under ICT companies needs? So how do you position yourself in terms, you know, of uh, ICT professional? Uh, and uh, besides that, I would like you to perhaps expand a little bit more on the finding and results that you are noticing with your software. And if you have any recommendation for uh, uh, young professionals or students, uh, you know, when it comes to pursuing their their dream job, their dream career, what would you would you recommend? I would say that we can uh, perhaps uh, squeeze uh, the, the two questions in one as the time is running is running late. So please, Gita, the floor is yours. Okay, I will answer the question uh, in the chat first. Um, technically, I would say as a job, no. But as I'm the founder of the company, it changes the platform. And I do see a, it as a, a, a need in the market. Uh, so I, I would rather, but that's more the entrepreneur in me speaking in here, uh, focus on what the market needs rather than what the job needs. If you're focusing on job and ICT skills, then probably the HR manager would say, mm, 
you're not graduated uh, graduated in ICT, big a big cross on my CV. So technically, I would say I, I would not immediately say I'm a, I'm a, I'm an ICT expert. Uh, in that field, I don't want to be in, uh, in 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 that field either. But what I do want to, to emphasize in there is how can we solve current pro problems or things that we might uh, be able to improve with technology. That means that you also just need to have common sense, use your life skills, the 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 skills that you have learned through your entire life as a child, as a young person, as an adolescent, and as an adult. How to be flexible how to lead, how to take initiative, and uh, not to forget, be productive. A and one of the other things that uh, we unfortunately uh, kind of, or at least the landscape is developing, are social skills. So uh, having the combination of your life skills and learning skills, the 21st century skills, uh, will, will, you will, you know, will, will actually, in the end of the day, be relevant uh, how you do, uh, what you do with it, and how you interact with people. When I see, when from an HR perspective, when I uh, see how uh, in onboarding processes in the industries, there's currently, and uh, I'm talking uh, about uh, several um, areas in Europe, uh, the, the process operate, uh, operation jobs are out there on a entry level, um, but also on a more specialized and advanced level, for like like uh, program, uh, like you know the specialized programmers, um, uh, and I think one of the one of the big hurdles in here is that the the, the landscape is uh, developing very fast. The the rapid development in technology also means that you need to be uh, up up to speed with your knowledge about. Uh, where the possibilities are. So basically, I would say, people, it's just like going to the gym. Use everything. That would be your recommendation, Gita. I think, uh, yeah, it's quite yeah. quite concrete and quite on point, indeed. In the end, end of the day, uh, uh, Alessandra, ICT is is just another way of doing uh, solving problems that we already have, or or improving our lives. Uh, uh, or, or current, our current circumstances in general. So I would say, look what you have and see how technology can can help to that help in that entire process. And once you have found that, yes, uh, of course, then uh, there are uh, specific areas like, okay, uh, is it is it ICT? Is it programming? Is it um, uh, the several stages of uh, artificial intelligence? starting from indeed machine learning to a more explanatory learning but i don't want to go into that technical detail it's in the end of the day which problem are we able to solve uh, with technology thank you thank you very much gita i know you have or you have also written a book about it so if you would like to paste the title in the chat perhaps uh, the audience can find it interesting thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your intervention and for your inspiring story here um now i would like to get back to Lyubcho to let him let's say finish uh, his presentation and to focus on this uh, uh, storytelling approach uh, which i find uh, very very interesting and also as a kind of closing statement you know, uh, what would you recommend to the generation of the future? You know, when it comes to uh, to choosing the the career they would like to to pursue, but for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, yes, we create story based curriculum uh, with storytelling. We are motivating all kids in the class to engage uh, and find their own place in the own place in the team, and they do this by using ICT. They use microbit, they use 3D printers, laser cutters in order to create and tell their own story. Uh, we started as an after school activity for kids, but later developed this in a full blown pedagogical material, as I said, for kids age 11, 17. And now our products and our boxes uh, are implementable in public, private schools, after uh, school and so on. We have four different curricula. If you go, if you can go to the last slide, please, Alessandra. Uh, city of the future, global warming, green engineers, and superheroes. Um, so kids in the class find their own role. Someone will be a developer, someone will be a mayor, someone will be an influencer, uh, let's say, and they either develop their own city of the future, 
uh, organize the mission to Mars and tackle some issues or realize the effects of global warming. As I said, we are present in 400 schools at, um, at the moment and um, we provide full support to teachers who have even not worked with 3D printers before. And uh, of course, we help companies get the employees of the future and the cities and governments to get uh, digital friendly citizens. Uh, so, in short, in, in terms of storytelling, just to finish on the storytelling part, I would say that, um, you know, we all have a story to tell, especially our kids. Uh, and it is our role as educator, but also as parents, uh, to, to enable them to find their path in life and tell their own story. And uh, regarding your second question about what I would recommend to students um, who would like to pursue an ICT career, if they already know they would like to pursue an ICT career, that's great. That means that, that they're already on the right path. But I would just like to encourage everyone that uh, it's too early to know uh, specifically. I mean, it was an amazing um, presentation by Anthony from OECD, you know, about uh, who knows uh, what they will do in 10 years from now. but. Uh, but let's be honest, most of us uh, do not and do not need to know, you know, the exact profession and the exact uh, chair in which office you will be working on. I, my suggestion is for uh, for students to know the general uh, things that they would like to see in a position. Maybe for someone is the money, maybe for someone is uh, ICT, maybe for someone is the agricultural sector, I don't know, using drones for the agricultural sector. But you see in all of these sectors, the knowledge of ICT and the digital literacy will be the basis. So um, my suggestion to them is this, to simply take it slowly and just know the basic parameters of what they would like to achieve um, in life or what the ideal uh, work would look like, and this can be later a pharmaceutical or any kind of company. And my last wider audience message would be that, uh, you know, unfortunately, digital skills cannot be passed from one generation onto another, like in the past. You know, the father was a blacksmith and the child was learning this from uh, their parent. Uh, now we have to acquire these skills. Uh, the digital uh, literacy is a must, and this is why we are focusing on um, on digital literacy of kids from 11 to 17 years old globally. Thank you, Alessandra. Yupcho, thank you very much for these very concrete recommendations. Uh, I tend to agree with you, meaning that digital is part of our everyday life uh, in work, uh, how we interact with people, everything has changed. So indeed, uh, whichever sector you're going to work in, uh, you're going to require at least some set of basic digital skills that you can then use uh, exactly as Lyubcho was saying in other sectors. So they are very transversal, very horizontal. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Gulin, you have already somehow inspired, uh, uh, you know, the audience with your stories and you have also already recommended, you know, people to believe in themselves. So I think that uh, that you have done already a sort of closing statement, but I would like you to perhaps talk uh, uh, briefly about your, uh, you know, skills, the skills that you acquired in yeah. Ready School and how you are using them in your current job. And if, you know, your business administration background has also helped some somehow or uh, or not. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, that's a great question, by the way. Uh, I would say Ready has greatly contributed to my professional life in a new country. It has opened the doors of the job market to me with its collaboration with the companies. And um, actually, I use what I learned in my daily work and I can easily understand and engage in conversations at work. So in addition, it's always good to know more to broaden your perspective and see it from different angles. Yeah, so thank you. Know as much as you can and learn. That's my advice. But actually, you mentioned a very important thing, which is the collaboration, you know, between training providers, the schools and the companies. So this is yeah. the way forward uh, uh, exactly to develop uh, trainings and learning materials. Uh, so to understand, you know, the right, the current needs and the fast changing needs of industries and then align the training and then, uh, you know, making people uh, uh, aware of the possibilities they have and the evolution that uh, it might happen, you know, during their, their career and moving towards a lifelong 
lifelong learning, as uh, as exactly. we used to say. So thank you very much for your story. You. Uh, last but not least, Elena, I know we have a video to show uh, of uh, one uh, uh, from one of sorry of the of the women that participate in the program. Uh, would you like to introduce it, perhaps uh, very very fastly, and then I can uh, I can play it. Yes, of course, very, very, very short. Now, this is Rocio Sillera. Rocio Sillera is a former, former student for Samsung Desarrolladoras, the first promotion. And I think that the, bueno, the, the sooner that we can watch the video is the better. <laughs> the better, the sooner. This is an example of how this kind of training can change your life. No? That uh, that was indeed a great testimonial. And uh, what I've learned myself today is really that the biggest uh, um, the biggest advice, the biggest piece of advice that you can give people is really not to be scared uh, to, you know, uptake uh, new skills, to use them and to find, you know, creative ways to, to use them. So I think that with this video, uh, I can close the panel session and uh, the event as well. I mean, I would, you know, really going on and on. I see also in the chat that uh, a lot of questions uh, are being put. So if uh, the speakers would like actually to reply in the chat directly feel free to do so but i will um, i'm anticipating you that we are opening a discussion thread in the community section of the platform where you can actually continue your conversation uh stating your questions uh, asking the speakers perhaps other questions that you might have and you can uh, continue this this very interesting debate uh, um in the platform um very quickly, uh, since we are already running late, I would just like to share the results uh, of the Mentimeter. So just to have uh, an idea of, uh, you know, what's uh, the background of the people involved and uh, and the audience. And then uh, perhaps uh, I think that we can all, you know, give ourselves uh, a, a break from this uh, from this event and then go back to to the platform and continue the, the presentation. So I can see here from this uh, from this uh, word cloud that uh, 
the background of the audience is the both actually, you know, related to ICT to ICT degrees, but also not related uh, at all. Let's say, like for instance, international relations, uh, cultural anthropology, perhaps are, you know, uh, subjects that are defined as more uh, humans, like humanities belonging to humanities. But uh, uh, we also see that uh, um, we have uh, ICT. Uh, computer science, uh, uh, management information. So I'm quite happy that the audience was that diverse. So I hope that everyone could get uh, really something useful from uh, from the speakers. Um, when it comes to uh, years of professional experience, we see it's uh, it's quite uh, variegated. So uh, we are going both from young professional to uh, you know manager, business owners, and more senior position. So with that, I would like to close uh, uh, the event. I would like to thank you all the speakers that participated today and gave a very important insight and uh, an inspiration to the audience. As I said before, the Digital Skills and Job platform is your one stop shop for digital skills and jobs. You can find training courses, you can find the reports, you can find the studies and uh, resources that you can use to improve uh, the level of your digital skills. You can also find all these uh, uh, good practices that we have uh, heard today. Uh, so you can, you know, get more inspiration and perhaps see what you can do uh, within your community uh, at local level. The platform is really wants to be really a place of exchange. Uh, so please uh, feel free and don't be scared as well to to create a login on the platform and uh, contribute to the conversation. So thank you very much and uh, I hope to see you all uh, next year when we will organize other other inspirational events like the one of this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Grazie, Alessandra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone.